Hi, these are the top 10 films of 1980, the year, not the 80s. When I say top 10, I mean my personal favourite films. Cheers. In at number 10, The Changeling, one of the best Canadian films of all time. This movie was slightly outshined by another haunted house film in 1980, but it's still tremendous. It stars the marvellous George C. Scott as a composer, in the shocking opening, he witnesses the death of his wife and daughter. He performs the overwhelming sense of loss brilliantly. While in mourning, he makes the foolish decision to move into what is clearly a haunted house. What sets this horror apart, though, is Scott's character's rational response to the haunting. He barely seems scared, and is mainly determined to find out why the spirits of the house are so upset. Who wouldn't want to see George C. Scott take on ghosts in an angry, rational way? Son of a bitch. What is it you want? What do you want from me? In a number nine, Kage Musha. This is one of Kurosawa's most visually breathtaking films. It's quite something to behold. Kurosawa was a master of so many techniques and styles, and this is the film that showed him as a master of colour in cinema. The film tells the story of the decoy of a recently assassinated daimyo. It's a real epic, and Tatsuya Nakada's performance as the Lord and Decoy grounds this huge tale. It has such a massive scale. Toho Studios couldn't afford to finish the film, so in step Francis Ford Coppola and Steven Spielberg. They got 20th Century Fox to provide the money to finish the movie. It's wonderful to see two great directors who have been so inspired by Kurosawa coming to his aid. Kurosawa left such a huge imprint on film, and what's astonishing is that all the way into the 80s, he was still at the top of his game. Kage Musha is a great film from a master of the art. In a number eight, The Last Metro. Speaking of great filmmakers continuing to make fantastic films, here we have what I think is one of Francois Truffaut's best movies. Set in Nazi-occupied Paris during the war, we follow the production of a play in a theater in Montmartre. The Jewish owner has fled Paris, and his actress wife, played by Catherine Deneuve, is in charge. She is tremendous in it. It's one of her best performances, and acting alongside her, both in the movie and in the play in the movie, is Gérard Depardieu. He is equally wonderful. 1980 was a great year for Depardieu. He gave brilliantly different performances in this, My American Uncle, and Lulu. The Last Metro is a beautiful portrayal of life behind the scenes at a theatre, but also capturing a feel of a place and a time. A time when Parisians filled cinemas and theatres, a time when they had to catch The Last Metro home due to a curfew, and a time when evil filled their streets. It's a very human film, full of humour, twists and turns, and brilliant little details. Truffaut wanted to make a trilogy about the entertainment industry, having already made Day for Night about filmmaking, this about a play, and finally he wanted to make one about a music hall. Truffaut wanted to retire as a director after making 30 films. Four years after The Last Metro, Truffaut died of a brain tumour at the age of 52. He had made 25 films. It would have been wonderful to have five more films from him, but within his 25 films, we have some of the greatest movies ever made. In a number seven, Melvin and Howard. When Jonathan Demme comes up, Silence of the Lambs is usually the film that springs to mind. But I think this comedy drama based on a bizarre true story is equally brilliant. Melvin is a working class man. He moves from shitty job to shitty job. One night, he finds Howard lying on the side of a road in the Nevada desert. He gives him a lift, assuming he's just some mad old man. He's not just some old man, he's the billionaire mad old man Howard Hughes. They sing some songs, and while Hughes tells him who he is, Melvin doesn't believe him even lending him some change. The rest of the film focuses on Melvin's life. It's a brilliant portrayal of life in middle America. Paula Matt is great as the happy-go-lucky Melvin, but stealing every scene she's in is Mary Steenburgen as his wife. A stripper, a waitress, a bit of a mess, but a wonderful character. She's hilarious and totally charming as the unreliable, difficult and somewhat mad mother of his child. We follow Melvin across the country in various jobs and relationships, and the film doesn't seem to have much structure, but it is fascinating in that regard. You are completely captured by this man's world. 
when one day he has left $156 million in a supposed will from the departed Hughes, his life goes into turmoil. Most films would concentrate on this drama, the courtrooms, the arguments and the huge stakes, but it's in this film's credit that it instead focuses on Melvin's life. It's 100 times more difficult to make this interesting, but the film succeeds, making it that much more involving. It's one of Paul Thomas Anderson's favourite films, and you can see the influence it had on him. From the very first shot... <laughs> the casting of Jason Robards... Bye, bye, Blackbird. The game shows... The star of Easy Street, Wally, Mr. Love Williams! Live from Burbank, California! First question for 25. This French playwright and actor joined the Bajar troupe of actors... This guy... Little candy box hat and everything. Your hands are cold. You want to put them in Uncle Wally's pocket? Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you in action. Jack says you've got a great big cock. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess so. May I see it? Really? Please. Thank you, Eddie. And a cast full of troubled characters. Don't you know I'm on the top of the list to win the Zenith 190K with the triple scope screen? Look, Melvin, what can I tell you? You know we base Milkman of the Month on the net. Yeah, before, it takes this much time to process. Right, you have to right. Well, months. how am I supposed to know this if, if you don't tell me this? If it's not in your rules and regulations, in the sure. fine print? I, that, that's an impossibility. For awesome. ah! Melvin and Howard is a triumph funny, touching, and totally unique. In a number six, Airplane, one of the funniest films of all time. The decision to take a serious movie like Zero Hour and just make a comedy version of each scene was genius. You ever been in the cockpit before? No, sir. I've never been up in a plane before. You ever been in a cockpit before? No, sir. I've never been up in a plane before. You ever seen a grown man naked? Two minutes don't pass without a laugh. Gotta get out of here! Down, get a hold of yourself. Calm down now, get back to your seat. I'll take care of this. Calm down, calm down. down. get a hold of yourself. Oh, do you want another phone? <laughs> Everything's <laughs> gonna be all right. Please. Sister, please. 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 It's brilliant fun, and bizarrely, even though it's so ridiculous and silly, Robert Hayes and Julie Haggerty still get you to care about their characters and relationship. Anyway, here's some more clips. Can you fly this plane and land it? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. There is only one river, there is only one sea. We need a free landing flight check. Tell them I'm in the dispatch office and I want it here fast. It's your wife. I want the kids in bed by night, I want the dog fed, the yard watered, and the gate locked. And get a note to the milkman. No more cheese. Starts with a slight fever, dryness of the throat. As the virus penetrates the red blood cells, the victim becomes dizzy. Begins to experience an itching, a rash. From there, the poison goes to work on the central nervous system, causing severe muscle spasms, followed by the inevitable grueling. At this point, the entire digestive system collapses, accompanied by uncontrollable flatulence, until finally the poor bastard is reduced to a quivering, wasted piece of jelly. 1980 was a great year for film. I could have done a top 20 or 30, but I thought I'd concentrate on the films that I'm really passionate about. But anyway, here are some other notable releases. Shogun Assassin. This re-edit of the first two Lone Wolf and Cart films is filled with plenty of extreme violence. Kill him! Cruising. William Friedkin and Al Pacino both took a huge chance making this film, a cop movie set in the gay leather scene in New York. Well, their bet didn't pay off. It got terrible reviews at the time, but over the years its reputation has rightly improved. It's a brilliant looking film and it's so daring. You've got to say it's got a lot of balls. Superman 2. 
After Richard Donner was removed due to disagreements with the producers, Richard Lester was brought in to finish the sequel. Lester brought with him his somewhat odd, childish sense of humour. It takes all the tension away from the dramatic scenes. I do still really enjoy it though. Robert Altman's Popeye. Robin Williams and Shelley Duvall were born to play Popeye and Olive Oil, and the wonderful Harry Nilsson wrote the score and songs. Speaking of great music, The Blues Brothers. John Landis's chaotic road movie is full of energy and top-notch musical numbers. The Coal Miner's Daughter. Sissy Spacek and Tommy Lee Jones are unbelievably good as Loretta Lynn and L Loretta Lynn's husband. Ordinary People won Best Picture. It gets a little bit Hollywood at the end with big emotional confrontations, but the bulk of this film is incredibly affecting and it's full of superb performances. Ah! Everyone wanted to rip off Star Wars. Almost all of them failed, but Gordon succeeded by being insanely camp and not taking itself remotely seriously. You've got a ridiculous brilliant Queen song, James Bond and Brian Blessed. Gordon's alive! He seemingly made a career of going on chat shows and saying that line, although he's clearly completely forgotten how he said it in the movie. Gordon's alive! 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 Dressed to Kill had Michael Caine in the role he was born to play. The first Friday the 13th was released and made a ton of money while not being very good. It was followed by nine sequels and a remake, none of which were very good. Yet I gotta say, I do have a soft spot for that franchise. You may only see it once, but that will be enough. Caddyshack was good, silly fun. Hey, you wanna make $14 the hard way? <laughs> For nudity lovers, there was the all-star cast Caligula. Alan Parker's fame took place in a performing arts school and was suitably filled with annoying characters. Macaroni and bologna, tuna fish, our favorite dish, I love. Yeah. And Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate put an end to the director-driven pictures of the 70s. My two least favorite films of 1980 are The Mind-Numbingly Dull Blood Beach and Cannibal Holocaust. That film can honestly go screw itself. Yeah, you make a satire about America's love with violence, but in making the film you kill a bunch of animals, including a turtle and a monkey, it's unjustifiable and simply horrible. And now back to the top 10. In a number five, The Elephant Man. The world is a strange place. Funny man Mel Brooks funded this dark, depressing and deeply moving picture. He had admired madman David Lynch's Eraserhead and suggested him as the director. What a partnership. Brooks purposefully left himself off the credits as to not confuse people into thinking it was a comedy. It certainly isn't funny. The true story of Joseph Merrick was a tragic one. John Hurt is out of this world as Merrick. The makeup is outstanding, but behind it Hurt brings such a human and gentle touch. The script has wonderful details to show Merrick as a fully developed character. He's not just depressed or upset, he's so much more a man with dreams, and even a little vanity, as we can all be vain at times. The supporting cast is remarkable. Anthony Hopkins is brilliant as the doctor who takes interest in Merrick, John Gielgud as the governor of the hospital the disabled man moves to, and Anne Bancroft as the actress the tragic character admires. Bancroft was married to Mel Brooks. When asked if she had auditioned for the role, Brooks said she had already won an Oscar for The Miracle Worker, and she was the producer's wife, so no, she didn't have to audition. Are you crazy? Unlike Tim Burton and Helena Bonham Carter, who insisted she audition for each role. Yeah, sure. The black and white cinematography is stunning, and John Morris's score is excellent. The ending of the film is beyond upsetting. Luckily, David Lynch bookends the film with very Lynchian scenes filled with dreamlike, odd images. By ending it in this bizarre way, it does stop the pain one feels as it comes to a close. The Elephant Man is a great movie. Lynch's second film is one of his least surreal and proved how good he is as a director. 
a man with a great vision who can be brought onto a project and bring his unique style. I'm still deeply upset he didn't direct Return of the Jedi. And he showed me these things called Wookiees. In a number four, The Long Good Friday. Without a doubt, one of the best British gangster movies. Bob Hoskins stars as East End criminal Harold Shand. It's a star-making performance. The East End is changing. Harold is trying to make a deal with members of the American Mafia to redevelop the Docklands. He's going to razzle and dazzle them on Good Friday. Well, it turns into a particularly rubbish day. His businesses are blown up, his men are killed, and he's got 24 hours to find who's behind it, stop them, and keep his deal going. It's a brilliantly British film. Francis Monkman's score is super cool, and the cast is perfect. Helen Mirren, Paul Freeman, and even a young Pierce Brosnan. It's a tough film, and completely unpredictable. You've no idea what's going to happen to Hoskins next, and you've no idea what he'll do in retaliation. It's fantastic. Hoskins' anger and facial expressions are riveting on their own. My favourite British gangster films have anger at their heart. This, Get Carter, and Sexy Beast are driven by fury. The violence in these films is so unpredictable because so many of the characters are constantly irate. The Long Good Friday had a small budget, under a million pounds. At one point it was destined for TV, but thank God George Harrison's production company, Handmade Films, bought the rights and released it in the cinemas. Bob Hoskins' face alone deserves the biggest screen possible. In a number three, The Empire Strikes Back. Without a doubt, one of the greatest sequels of all time. George Lucas made so many good choices, mainly stepping back a little and bringing in Irvin Kirshner to direct and get other people to write the script. The original Star Wars was a masterpiece, but here the script is sharper, funnier and more romantic. Kirshner as the director seems more interested in the actors, and all the main cast give better performances here. It is also by far the most beautiful looking Star Wars film. The sets, the location photography, the costumes, Ben Burtt's sound design, the action and John Williams' score are all iconic. And it was incredibly brave of Lucas to end the picture with the heroes losing. The shock of the twist and the freezing of Solo make for one of the great cinematic cliffhangers. The Star Wars films that followed have never hit the heights of these first two. The Empire Strikes Back is operatic science fiction at its best. A roller coaster that takes you on an emotional ride and a ride through a galaxy far, far away that you simply love spending time in. In a number two, Raging Bull. Scorsese is a master filmmaker and this is one of his very best films. In the late 70s, Scorsese's drug use was out of control, and after suffering an overdose, he thought his directing days were behind him. Robert De Niro visited him in hospital and convinced him to get off the coke and make this movie. Scorsese assumed this would be his last film, and so put all his effort and energy into making it a great one. And boy oh boy did he. Everything here is exemplary. The acting, including the at the time unknown Joe Pesci, Michael Chapman's astonishing black and white cinematography, Paul Schrader and Maddock Martin's brutal script, and of course Thelma Shoemaker's one-of-a-kind editing. Much like so many of Scorsese's best films, our protagonist is not particularly likeable, but through wonderful storytelling, Scorsese gets us to care and even relate to this violent man. De Niro gives a transformative performance, and the makeup and the weight gain are quite remarkable. As usual, Scorsese's use of music is spot on, and his eye for detail and character shine through. Scorsese was saving his life while making it. You'd assume someone, having been through what he'd been through, would be making something a little safer. But no, he went all out and it paid off. Raging Bull is a masterpiece made by a man in full control of his art. And in at number one, The Shining. When Stanley Kubrick worked in a new genre, he always somehow managed to nail it, even perfect it. Whether it be war, science fiction, comedy, war, or war. And this, his first and only horror film, is one of the greatest of all time. After the financial failure of Barry Lyndon, Kubrick felt he needed a hit. He was a voracious reader and began to read horror novels in an attempt to get ideas. Stephen King's The Shining hit a note. Stephen King hated Kubrick's adaptation, and you could argue that it's not a great adaptation, but it is the best movie to be based on one of his works. 
King is a writer whose books deal with morality and people making choices and gaining control over evil. In Kubrick's film there is no control. The evil of the house does what it wants. Jack Nicholson is pretty mad to begin with, but his losing his mind over the course of the winter in the hotel is done brilliantly. He seems genuinely unstable, and as he's hunting his family down with an axe, you feel there is a high probability that he will butcher them. Danny Lloyd gives one of the great child performances as Danny, and much credit has to be given to Shelley Duvall. She went through hell during the making of this movie, but she's fantastic in it. The cinematography is beyond brilliant. The camera movement is smooth, and every corner you take fills you with dread. People love to read into Kubrick's movies, and fine, go ahead, but part of the joy of them is the ambiguity and the mystery. The last shot leaves you with thoughts and ideas. You go away thinking about the film and about the Overlook Hotel, and of course about what that bear and man were doing in the bedroom. The film was a moderate success and got mixed reviews. Kubrick was even nominated for a Razzie for Worst Director, which is you know, ridiculous. Luckily, it is now seen as the masterpiece it is. Stanley Kubrick was one of the great artists of the 20th century, and his only foray into horror is scary and breathtakingly brilliant. Right, so counting down my top 10. In a number 10, The Changeling. In a number 9, Kage Musha. In a number 8, The Last Metro. In a number 7, Melvin and Howard. In a number 6, Airplane. In a number 5, The Elephant Man. In a number 4, The Long Good Friday. In a number 3, The Empire Strikes Back. In a number 2, Raging Bull. And in a number 1, The Shining. 1980 was an amazing year for cinema, and these are my top 10, but I've missed loads out, so what are your top 10, 20, 30, 40 movies of the year 1980? Cheers.